Hello, everyone. Good to see you all. I'm Kelly Baisley, School and, Pro School and Family Programs Manager here at the Asheville Art Museum. Today, I'm joined by Hank Bovey, touring docent, and Sheila Langdon, touring docent. Each Friday at 12 p.m., docents lead virtual interactive conversations about a few artworks in our collection or special exhibitions. The goal is simple. Slow down, discover the joy of looking at art, and talk about the experience with others. For today's program, Hank and Sheila are going to lead us in an interactive conversation about three artworks in our special, special exhibition, A Telling Instinct. We're kind of continuing the conversation if some of you all were uh, here last week because we also looked at artworks in the same exhibition. We'll spend about 15 minutes or so with each artwork. Hank and Sheila will allow us time to look at each artwork on our own slowly before leading a conversation about each one with questions. As participants, we encourage you to engage in dialogue with Hank, Sheila, and myself and each other throughout the hour. Right now, everybody's microphone is muted by default. We have a couple of suggestions for uh, your experience today. Choose a quiet room and close the door and silence any alerts from uh, devices that might be nearby. Try not to sit in front of a strong light source. Use headphones and uh, microphone for best sound quality. Use a desktop, laptop, or tablet to see slides and meeting tools on a larger screen. And make sure your screen name has your first name and last initial or first name and last name. To ask questions or make comments, you have a couple of options. You can unmute your microphone and answer. You can type into the chat box, which we will try to get to comments in there as best as we can. Or you can raise your hand in the participant sidebar and someone will call on you. We are recording today, so if you prefer not to be recorded, please mute your audio and your video, and you can use the chat box. Does anyone have questions before we start? Okay, Hank, what will we be talking about today? Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Slow Art Friday. I'm Hank Bobby, touring docent at the Asheville Art Museum. And I see a couple of new folks out there, at least new to me, so glad to have you. And of course, the folks that um, I've seen on other Fridays, welcome back. And um, today we are going to talk about, as Kelly said, some um, artworks from the Telling Instinct exhibit. The reason Sheila and I chose this exhibit is way back in time prior to the pandemic, so back in February, um, the Asheville Art Museum brought in a new exhibit, A Telling Instinct. And in that exhibit, basically it's a mix of Audubon images and some contemporary art images. And the, you know, part of the exhibit is, as you all know with Audubon exhibit, you have those very um, realistic images of animals. Um, often he gives them human-like um, expressions. Um, there's typically a story that can be gleaned from the images. And the same thing with the contemporary works that have been brought into the exhibit. We'll see, there's a lot of um, allegory in those images. You know, some of the issues may be different that the story's about, but they still tell a story using animals. When they first trained the docents on the exhibit, A Telling Instinct, I thought it was a wonderful exhibit. You know, who could argue with the beauty behind Audubon prints? And then the contemporary artists that were chosen were all outstanding. We were trained. I could not wait to give my first tour um, of A Telling Instinct. As soon as the, the tour schedule came out, I signed up. I was ready to go. And then, bam, the museum closed because of the pandemic. So none of us got to give tours. None of us got to see the exhibit. Um, and then just recently, the, as you all know, the museum has reopened. Um, the exhibit was extended, but it's only going to be here for another month. But it was such a wonderful exhibit that Sheila and I thought we would, you know, take one last chance to share it. And hopefully, um, if you've not seen it, I'm inspired to come in and look at the exhibit. So um, last thing before we move on to the slides, as Kelly said, 
you know, um, the format's pretty much, we'll look at the artwork for a few moments. I will ask you a question or two. We'll have a discussion. And as you respond, um, feel free just to jump in and talk. You can use the chat box. I'll be very honest. I'm not a good multitasker. So me watching and talking and looking at the chat box is not always my best effort. So if you sat there for a long time in the chat box, feel free to speak up. But Sheila and Kelly are also going to help me watch the chat box. We kind of have each other's back on that. So with that said, we'll look at an artwork. We'll take a few moments, and then we'll talk about it. So Kelly, if you would flip to that first slide. And then you all take a few moments to look at it, and then we'll talk about it. So, all right, now that you've had just a moment to look at this, um, before we talk, I want to also let you know, because this might help you view it uh, more appropriately, is this is a very large image. It is six by 20 feet. So it's six feet tall and 20 feet long. It takes up a significant piece of wall in the museum. So with that said, what do you, what's going on in this artwork? Well, these are mainly tigers and zebras and uh, in some kind of a pool. I really happen to like this particular artwork. I, I can see the colors on the tiger, even though it is black and white, and I know they'd be orange and black, and I can almost feel texture coming through for the softness of um, their fur. A, a good point. It is, you know, and that's part of that that hyper realism that I mentioned, and where you can, even though they're black and white, like you said, you can see the color, you can see the uh, the texture of the fur. What else can we see? Well, it's it's a fantasy picture. Uh, they're, first, they're having fun. They're having a, a, and we have two new kittens, which I'm sure you've all seen too much of in the last few weeks. Uh, and this is exactly what they do all day long. Uh, they grab at each other and toss each other around. But what I love about this the most is they're also birds. It's a seascape. Uh, and so they have beach balls and those uh, floaty tubes and water wings. Oh, really? And uh, uh, it makes no sense at all, but it's fun to look at. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Um, what else do we see? Well, to me, it seems like quite a paradox because I don't think those animals would typically be comfortable with each other. Um, in fact, I think they'd probably be at a, the, the tigers would be at the throat of the zebras and the bird too. So, so it uh, has the appearance of being uh, frivolous and lighthearted yet uh, uh, a paradox because uh, you wouldn't expect that kind of uh, camaraderie among those animals. And, I think and we're, they, don't, they don't live together. I mean, they that? don't live in the same part of the world. But if we look closely, you know, initially, as, as someone commented, it does look like they're frolicking in a pool having a good time. But if you look closely, are they really all having fun? <laughs> I don't know. The zebra is losing his stripes. Yeah. <laughs> I would think that he has sort of a... Uh, a frightened look on his face that the seabird is ripping away a stripe. Well, exactly, and, and that was, you know, the zebra is ripping a stripe, but how, how, do how is he losing that stripe? Hank? Yes, Lynn. Lee, go ahead. Um, I'm really interested in the process of this, and the artist, um, do you have any idea how she starts something like this? So when, when I did some research on the artist, first off, it is, um, it is pencil. She uses um, paper, pencil, and a sock. And that's how she describes her. Right. And she does not pre-plan um, her images. She just starts and they evolve um, through her own experiences with people and the absurdities of life is how she described it. Wow. Well, it's quite something. It, it is. And it's, you know, if you've seen it in the museum, it, it, you know, the size yeah. makes it even more. Um, but let's go back to um, um, 
my comment about, you know, in, in the exhibit, there's a lot of allegorical okay. images. Um, what kind of story can you all glean from this? Well, now that I see the stripes being torn off to zebras, I didn't even notice that before. It seems like it's uh, a little more hellish than, than what I initially thought it was. So that's interesting. You look at more of the detail and um, the, the whole, um, the whole uh, storyline seems to change. It does change. Right. As you look at the detail, you start seeing things aren't what they necessarily appear on the surface in this, in this image. Right. So what else can we see? I'm noting that the zebras are mostly the ones that are upside down or sideways. The tigers appear to be, you know, right up and vertical. And um, even that little zebra on the left with the tiger with the beach ball almost looks like he's like, I don't know, being strangled by that tiger. It's hard to say. He's like, it could be a hug, but it looks like he's trying to get away. And um, did you notice how the zebras, several of them have clips or clamps like I use on chips, on chip bags uh, to hold their stripes on? Look around the neck. Yeah, and I think those are, and they are there, and, and, and that's a good observation. And that they do have clips. I think those are actually, um, those images are water wings like you would give, you know, uh, children. Um, now look at the neck. Look at the neck. I see where she's highlighting it, yes. Because if, in that same vein, if you look at the zebra that's to the left, that's losing its stripes, um, how, how is it losing its stripes? Well, there's a pair of scissors here someplace. The one in the center, there are scissors next to the stripes, right next to the neck and the head. Right. And, you know, something that I, I enjoy thinking about when I look at this is that the only that I can think of, the cats and, and zebras, or tigers and zebras, are the most predominant of the striped animals in, in nature. Is there a competition going on here? Well, that's a good question. Um, what do you think? Because, I, you know, I didn't think about that until just now that all the, you know, the two mammals in here anyway are striped as opposed to not being striped. So I don't know. Well, and I, if I, once again, if I may say just one other thing about humor, the, I do love the water wings on the, on the seabirds. It's not like they need water wings. <laughs> <laughs> I find the little, um, I don't know what they, they almost look like chickens, but I, I guess there's some sort of waterfowl on yeah. the far right, the far left, and then in the center, the two, looks like two of them there perhaps. And I guess they're kind of the little ones, yes. Yeah. The, the other huge creatures and seem to be oblivious to them. You know, they, they don't seem to be being bothered in one way or the other. They just happen to be there. So, Let's expand on that thought because that's also something that is not immediately, a, you know, aware you're aware of in this image is that, you know, there's these larger, more dominant animals, and they're ignoring these smaller animals that are, you know, kind of on the edge of things or on the fringes. Um, and if you compare that to the human condition, what does that say? So we have a comment, um, maybe those are rubber duckies. <laughs> Just bathtub toys, huh? And let's see, so I got two things in my chat. All right, and let me ask another question here. So as I mentioned, the artist um, says that her works evolved her experiences with people and the absurdities of life. So if you look at this image and in your mind, um, instead of tigers and zebras and, and different forms of seabirds, they are people. What would you say about that? I think the um, tiger on the far left that looks like he's being cuddled in the head by the descending zebra. Yes, if you follow his, his front leg, 
he's got it his paw is on top of and looks like is <laughs> not being very friendly to the um to the to the zebra under his paw so is that speaking to um you know a what about a human that that um, he can be sneaky <laughs> and he can be accepting the love and affection and then turn around and be hard and, and cold, um, which both of we, we all have both sides, cuddles and ugly. <laughs> so, so you're thinking that perhaps there is some symbolism here around a couple of facets of human personality that the well, it just it, it, yes, it, it, if you want to make the stretch, yes, that's what I would. I would, you know, he's being all lovey and cuddly, but yet he has his paw on the head of his neighbor. I can see that. What else do we see? Well, the expressions on the faces of each animal are very unique. The one that's in the center that has his head on the lion or on the tiger, I mean. Um, look at the fear in his eyes and in his mouth. His, his facial expression is very fearful. And in fact, when I've been in the museum, when I look at this piece, that's where my eye goes first, interestingly enough, was to his, or went first when I saw it, was to his face. So, um... So the thing that is that I'm seeing, but I can't really interpret very well, is that um, typically when you see these animals together, you would actually see violence. You know, I mean, tigers yeah. don't just put a paw on the head of a zebra. You know, they, they are very aggressive and violent. And yet here we're not seeing overt violence, but we're seeing the zebra's stripes being pulled. Mm. And I, I don't really understand what that means, you know? So, and it's not the tiger that's doing it, it's the birds that are doing it. So I'm trying to understand the story. Um, and, and I'm just a little confused, like I said, with the fact that the violence is more subtle and it's not really happening from the one that would that you would expect would be doing the violence, you know, so it's happening by the birds. So I'm just asking the question. I don't really have an answer to that, but that's what I'm seeing. And I'm just trying to make sense of it. You know, and, and um, I think your question's a good one that, you know, um, as you mentioned, there is uh, on the surface, there just appears to be a pool party, which is the name of the work. Um, however, there is a little details that, that show us there's a definitely violent side to this work. And in the particular, what you're mentioning is the zebra losing a strike, whereas in, in the real world, so to speak, the tiger would be the predator of the zebra. Um, yeah. But in this image, it's the bird that is unraveling the zebra. And, and in the real world, the tigers live in one part of the world and the zebras live in another part of the world. Yeah. Tigers are Indian, zebras are African. This is true, and they and they typically and, and don't one of them lives at the beach. So, so I think it's the zebra that if you go from the left as you're uh, from the right, excuse me, if you're viewing the picture, you see a zebra, a bird, and then there's the zebra near the top. I can't tell what's on his legs, but it almost looks like they're bound. Yes, in water, wings. They're, water wings. they're like blow up water wings. Uh, yeah. Oh, floaties, yeah. Floaties. Yeah. Okay, interesting. But yet he's the one near the sky and not in the water. So uh, right. Uh, I was going to say maybe um, Ayla, your comment slash question kind of made me think back to what Hank said in the beginning about how the artist says that she um, is inspired by her about you know, human stories and human connections and then kind of translate the, those to animals in the artwork. So maybe, you know, because this isn't how we would see these animals interacting in, in nature, maybe that's just kind of the, I don't know how she makes it kind of fun, but it's really about people and 
you know, maybe that people have these different sides to themselves, like Sheila said earlier. And then it's just, um, I don't know. I don't know how she picks the animals, but maybe it's just to make us kind of question things like we are now. So, and, you know, I think that's a very valid point because, you know, if, if we think about this exhibit, you know, in, in probably all of these works, or a significant number of them, these animals really are metaphors for humans. You know, in Audubon, a lot of his works, that's exactly what's going on. Um, and same thing with these more contemporary artists. These animals are really metaphors for humans. And with that said, if you look at this, and the title is Pool Party, and let's just pare that down to party. I think probably all of you at one point in your lives, maybe not in the past several months, have been to a party. And how many of you have been to parties where it was like this? Oh, yeah. Or, or as a mother, if you think about kids in the pool playing and how everybody's having a good time and they're on, on, particularly on the fringes, but then you can have problems. Somebody's gonna, somebody gets hurt. Exactly. You can have problems. There's this undercurrent of competition between mm -hmm. zebras and tigers and or different people and then this bird pulling the stripes off the zebra. You know, we've all met that bird at a party. Well, some are more domineering than others. I mean, why do the tigers have the beach balls? I mean, are they taking all the toys, you know? Could be. Lee, I'm going to interject for, am I, am I muted? I'm You're good. Sure. You said the, uh, the, this is a very large uh, piece of art. And are we seeing a, a large percentage of it? Are, are there, I mean, are we seeing the, the, uh, the heart of the work? Or is there, are there other things that uh, yeah. might be visible this, to us who would change? This is, the, this is the entire image, so. It is, I see. Okay. So any last comments on this? I wanted to quickly comment to Lee that in the uh, museum, there is a video somewhere uh, we've seen on this artist producing the work. So if you're really very interested in, um, in like you said, the, the mechanics of it, there is a video somewhere floating around because we've seen it as it's those. It's um, something that we showed in a virtual visit, Sheila, I think. So if you Google or search on YouTube, um, Adana Care in the studio, it actually shows her working on this exact artwork. And it's a, a really interesting video. Yep. So, and that is, I looked on the website, it's not there, but as Kelly said, you can find it on YouTube. I, I was able to locate it yesterday when I was getting ready for, for our day today. So Kelly, if you would flip to the title slide. Um, here's the specifics on this. The artist is Adana Carey. It's from 2015. As I mentioned, it's carbon pencil on paper, six by 20 feet. And just a couple things. Um, Adana Carey um, is from Iowa. She currently is in Burbank, California. She's got her um, Master of Arts and Master of Fine Arts from California State University in Long Beach. Um, and she typically has a focus on large scale pencil drawings, just like this one. And if you look um, at her other works, they, uh, there's a lot of um, similar works where the animals kind of give us a story about, about humans. And I, I read you her artist statement, um, but she has been compared to Audubon as far as the photorealism of her illustrations. Hers are a little bit more surreal. Even though Audubon, you know, um, made it, gave his animals human-like expressions, they were still in their natural setting and doing what they would normally do, eating lizards or whatever. Um, you know, and one last interesting piece about Adana is she is also a tattoo artist. So if you are in the mood for some skin decoration, it happened to be in Burbank. <laughs> so... With that said, I'm going to throw the program over to Sheila, and she's going to um, walk you through the next piece of work art. Sheila, you're muted. Here I am. Here I am. Here I am. All right. 
Thank you're you. familiar with the fact that we, hi, by the way, I am Sheila Langdon and I am a Turing docent, newly minted. Um, uh, as you're aware, we, we start this, uh, these segments by asking you to look closely at the artwork. Um, here, I'm going to say you could probably spend more than the 10 or 12 seconds but we're not going to be able to. So I'm going to say, suggest that you look with a very probing eye at this artwork because there is just so much uh, to mm -hmm. dig in. Um, I hate to uh, I hate to back you off from looking at it, this, but um, there's a there's just so much narrative in this artwork that who would like to uh, begin the conversation about what your takeaway is? I like the colors. I mean, the colors are fascinating and um, the shapes, but I'm also struck by the dual medium, the way the exterior pieces and the birds or, or flowers or trees are um, outside of the actual picture. Can you see, um, and I don't know that you can, but can you see anything um, on the birds that tell, that, that underlines the story going on in the actual uh, canvas piece. I don't know that you can see that. And if you can, it just adds to it. And if you can't, I'll tell you about it. <laughs> anybody, anybody see well enough um, on top of the birds? It, it looks like barbed wire. These are the exterior birds, the, the wooden okay, pieces birds. outside the frame, outside the frame is, is because um, all right, it, it is difficult to see in this slide, but there are five birds on mm -hmm. the right, the left mm -hmm. and underneath and each the, the top one starts with the um, skull of a skeleton. And then it just goes down into the various parts, the, the skull, the shoulders, the midsection, um, the legs, and then the feet. So each of those five sets of birds has a part of a skeleton uh, on top of it in a very uh, eerie green, I don't know if it's a glitter paint. Is it painted on? It's painted on, and it looks to me as a as a novice looks like a glitter paint. It's very um, um, striking, very striking. So that being said, what do you see? Uh, why why do you think he is um, underlining that, or really uh, um, emphasizing the skeletal of uh, forms on top of the birds within the painting. Can someone, uh, for instance, speak, well, someone started to speak with the, uh, to the uh, ivory-billed woodpeckers that are very prominent on the, on the, uh, what would that be? A pine tree, I believe, in the center of the image. I think Billy. Or an electric pole. If or an electric pole. Right in the center, mm -hmm. there's the old fashioned mm -hmm. insulators. Okay, and you, you, uh, you commented that they are wrapped in barbed wire. Barbed wire. Yeah. So they are, would you say, in a. <laughs> in a good position? Uh, not really. No, 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 no. What else can you see? And, and, you... and they're over traffic. Yeah, so, they're out over a very busy highway. 
or strict. What else can you see if you, if you, what, there's something very telling, I think, about uh, this artist's message sort of behind that uh, pole or tree trunk or, um, do you see, does anybody see a statement being made behind, behind there? Well, it's very uh, ominous and isn't, isn't the wood on fire? I mean, there's a lot of indication of flame or fire there. Right, right, right. Uh, this, this artist has um, typically or often uh, used two different approaches and one very modern and one very, uh, very class or even ancient, if you will, um, illumination of medieval manuscripts with the very bright and, and um, pulsing colors to, to illuminate the story, which I think Laurel mentioned before, the, the colors. And then um, a lot of assemblage of image. And at the bottom, you see across the bottom of the, um, of the canvas, there are, uh, which you probably can't pick up on too well on this slide, but though there are one, two, three, four, five, six, I think, uh, uh, sections of assemblages which is, of course, very, uh, very modern technique versus the uh, illuminated um, methods that he's used here. So yes, there's a lot of, of fiery uh, coloration. That, I think, I will, um, uh, Kelly, if you'll point out from the behind the tree, there is a truck, is what that is. And the, there it is, there's the cab of the truck and it, there are flames there and the uh, logging load that it is carrying is probably related to that pole that the um, ivory billed woodpeckers are on. So <laughs> what kind of story, what kind of image what kind of narrative is this artist trying to um, trying to present? See, just a couple of things I've observed is is um, as you mentioned the truck with the logs on it, and it's basically heading out of the picture. It's taking those logs away, you know. So to me, that kind of says it is, you know, taking those birds' habitat out of there. And the fact that the, the cab of the truck does have the flames coming up, I don't think that's so much that the truck is on fire. I think it is more that the truck is the source of the fire. Is the source of what's going, the story that's being told. Right. And if, and if you look to the far right of the image, you see um, other animals that are fleeing, I believe. Do you see the, uh, there they are. They are also trying to get away. I see those that also in the top left, it looks to me where the orange and purple is, that those birds are trying to flee. Keep going up higher, a little higher. Yeah, up, yeah over to the right, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, no, to the left, the left of the pole. Uh, <laughs> anyway, to the, there you are. Yeah. Um, those look like birds fleeing to me. And it just looks like there's a, um, incompatible there with the, the, the human um, forces as well as the natural habitat there. I think we can speak to um, part of the artist's statement about this that Laurel, you just, you hit right on it. He says, this is not so much an indictment of development, hunting, clear cutting, or carnage of the animals on our back roads and highways, but more of a prompt to steer we human sinners from our current road to perdition back on the path of righteous stewardship of the natural environment. So he's very, um, oh, dramatically, I believe, with his coloration and with his, his movement, lots of movement in this in this image, the birds, the leaping deer, the um, 
um, uh, there's a little lizard uh, that's wriggling away. Uh, he's really making a very strong statement about the environment. And that mm -hmm. could be because he is um, a 35 year uh, member of the art community at Florida State University. He first came to Florida when um, it was in a different state than he considers it being in now. Um, he is um, somewhat horrified um, by what, he, what he's seeing in the environment, in Florida in particular. So these are a lot of images of, of Florida, mm -hmm. fl uh, Florida, flora and fauna, if you will. Um, at the very bottom, excuse me, not at the very bottom, but at the bottom in the assemblages, he has uh, some um, pierced, it's either tin or aluminum. You see the, what would it be? The one to the third one and the fifth one have pierced uh, mm -hmm. spots on them. One says Tallahassee and the other is the, um, and, they, and they have the skeletons that he's repeated out on the birds. Um, and he's got um, uh, the Latin term for the ivory-billed woodpecker. Um, and they're all very um, frightening. They're all very frightening. So what else can someone comment? Something else I see that, that caught my eye is, probably everyone else's eyes, the birds around the edge, they're going down the right side, across the arm and up the left side. Um, and if you look closely, and it may be hard to do on the slide, you can see that they are red-winged blackbirds. They've got the little red um, spots on their shoulders. And I thought about that, and, and red-winged blackbirds, and I think, you know, I'm not a bird expert, but I think they are typically found like in the plains, and the prairie, out in the wide open spaces. You know, and here they are on the museum wall instead. You know, so I think that just adds to that same story of, of the natural habitat changing because of man. So what emotion is evoked by uh, studying this image? What, what, what does it say to you? It's fearful, anxiety. I think, I think yes, fear, fear and anxiety are two of the emotions that he is, the artist is um, very definitely trying to have you feel. And sadness, you know, sad that this is all going on in this fashion. I think the bright colors make me think of violence, actually. Um, probably the reason for the anxiety. So the use here. of the, of the uh, very um, vibrant and piercing colors, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, the image, I'm going back to the images across the bottom, uh, or, the, or the assemblages, if you will. That can be called um, a predella. And a predella is a, hmm, I'm, I'm at a loss for the word, is it can be a platform on which to set an altar. And uh, back to what I read you in the artist's statement of, use the word sinners and perdition and um, um, some very sort of religious imagery. Um, he, he has, it has been said of him that, and I'm going to find it so I don't mis, misread the, ah, uh, that this, mm -hmm. someone has said of this piece and this artist, because he's done multiples of these sorts of, of, uh, of uh, artworks, that he, they, he, they, it could, this one in particular, could be an altarpiece in the Cathedral of Nature. Um, underlining that the saints have fur and feathers, the demons are the hunters, modern life encroachment. And he has also used the predella there. So it very well may be that he is making um, 
a um, spiritual religious statement, not not by by name of of religion, but just in a, a philosophic statement on um, we the humans being the sinners. Don't you find don't you find the book that's in the center, the lower center, with the pencils and uh, the open book page? Uh, it's it's interesting, and I can't tw quite tell what it's trying to what it, what it illustrates. But there's an open book hanging in there, and you will right there, almost right there, Kelly. Stop right there. Yeah. You'll see that there. If you could see it very um, clearly, it's a paint bottle and paint brushes. Okay. And see behind the book, uh, there what looks like an artist palette the other way, Kelly. Oh, yeah, yeah. I see that. Um, so I'm curious about that myself. I have not come to a conclusion about what he was trying to say with the book, the paint, the brushes, the palette. Being um, so curiously placed. It's, yes. it's, they, they appear to be either... Uh, hanging on a wire or just floating. So is he, I don't know, is he speaking of himself as an artist getting involved in this issue or I don't, what does, does anyone have a further suggestion of what that might mean? I kind of think what you just said that perhaps that palette and the paintbrushes and so on represent the artist. So he's put himself in this, in this painting and he's put himself in there, it's kind of twofold. One, he's part of the problem because all of us humans are. And two, though, he's maybe looking at himself as part of the solution by putting this out there for us to look at and learn from. I, that was my hope, that he was, he was saying as an artist, he was presenting this um, subject matter to be dwelt upon, if you will. So this is why I would encourage you. This, this piece is very large also, very intense in color. There is another piece by this artist who is Mark Messersmith uh, next, mounted next to this piece on the wall in the museum. It'll only be there until November 30th, but there's so much story to absorb from the... Um, from the telling of this story, uh, that it be, I would strongly re re uh, recommend that you go back in to the museum and, and look at it yourself. I, I thought it was also a, a, an aside, this has really nothing to do with what we've been talking about, but I thought it was interesting as an aside in my research, I found that the artist said that gardening and painting are almost the same thing. Creating a world that's an avoidance of the world. So those of you who are gardeners, <laughs> please know that you are painters as well. Can we see the slide on this uh, piece, Kelly? Those Left Behind is the title. Very, very telling, I think, a telling statement by Mark Messersmith. Like I said, he's been a, um, affiliated with the uh, Florida State University for 35 years as a uh, instructor, professor of, of uh, art and of painting and drawing. This is oil on canvas with the carved wood. It also has the assemblages across the bottom. It's 90 by 70 inches. Uh, and it is well worth um, giving it some time and some thought. So Hank, back to you. Oh, I, have a couple, next. I have a couple thoughts. Oh, please. Sorry, I didn't want to stop the, the flow. Um, but just I'm just thinking of it um, from a couple perspectives and also in dialogue with um, Adana Kara's work too. Um, I agree that there's 
there's, you know, there's a lot of, that comes off of this piece that is very um, ominous, um, very, uh, and then also didactic. Um, um, if it, you know, it's called those left behind. But there's there's also some interesting components about it that, you know, as much as the the vibrant coloring is very evocative, there's not too much to me at least about the coloring that is very um, dark and scary. There's not like very, you know, um, dark reds or dark blacks. There, it's a psychedelic feel um, to it. Um, another thought to that is there's not a lot of dead animals. There's, there's a lot of life. Um, and it's really interesting in that term because the ivory-billed woodpecker is extinct. Um, so if he's framing it right in the center um, with several of them, there is this, you know, implicit hope or an implicit um, regenerate, regenerative capacity to that. Um, and I think that's also identified with some of the luna moths that are uh, to the right, uh, center right of the ivory-billed woodpecker. Um, and then the, uh, one of the things that makes me think of that is the piece of wood that's coming off the canvas, um, painted off of the canvas, you know, center left and down below. It's kind of a thing that's breaking that fourth wall kind of thing, um, which, you know, speaks more to his didactic component, you know, um, trying to get us to think about some of these conservation issues. I think that piece of wood that's breaking off and pulling you, it's literally pulling you in to the, um, to the experience of what's going on here is very interesting. So as much as there isn't a forest that all these things are uh, framed within, it is far more ecological than Adonacara's one where like was mentioned before, like the zebras in Africa, um, the tigers in India, that's very ahistorical. It's very not ecological. It's far more zoological. Um, so there is more of a dialogue here where the Adana Kara's one is almost dystopian in a weird way. And this one is more realistic representatively. So pleasing to hear that it all isn't a negative takeaway. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, well, thanks for letting me share. I want, I want, real quickly, uh, I have never been, I have never taken an artist class. I take, I've taken a lot of classes in my life, but I've never taken one where you actually talk about a piece. I'm married to an artist, but, uh, so I think if I were in an art museum earlier than today, I would probably, I would probably walk right by this and think, not, not give it much thought, but after hearing all the comments and the ways of looking at it, I think I would slow down and try to figure out what was going on. Although it would certainly extend my time in the art museum, but I, but hearing the things people have to say about it, it really does add a lot, a lot of depth to it. So I really appreciate that. And I wish I would have had something to say, but that's all I can say right now. So <laughs> you just, whoops, you just said the most, used the most wonderful word. Am I muted? No, we heard just you. Now you are. Oh, now <laughs> mute, unmute. When you said "slow down," yep. The type, the name of this this effort to to talk about art is "Slow Art Friday," and one mm -hmm. of the things docents really try to impress upon people is to slow down and look. Well, it, it's happily Thanks for using that particular time. word. Yeah. Well, thank you. All right, Sheila, are, are we ready to move to the next one? Yes, yes, Hank, please All do. Right. So Kelly, if you would advance a couple slides and let's take a few moments, look at this and then we'll talk about it. Okay, folks, um, I'll go ahead and start asking questions. And the first one, as always, is what do you think is going on in this artwork?
simplistically, it's a hummingbird. I mean, that's what it looks like to me, a hummingbird. Um, and the, the blossoming of the uh, foliage there and the fact that the hummingbird is midair. Um, it's just very simple. There are five hummingbirds. It looks like lunchtime. <laughs> so, in, I mean, this kind of goes back to what, what Richard said about slowing down. I think it's always good to start simplistically. What do we see on the surface? And then if you slow down a little more, what else do we see? So that's my next question. What else can we see? You can see the smokestacks on the um, on the bottom on the left there appear mm -hmm. to be smokestacks. And, you know, I do see the five hummingbirds, Billy. Yes. But there were five of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't see that at first, did you? I saw the yeah. one in the air. My eye was drawn to the one in the air, and I, yeah. I wasn't drawn to the ones with the, the heads missing, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. so, Hank, is this an Audubon? This is not. And uh, this is not actually Walton Ford, although I can see why you might think it's an Audubon, but here's a big difference. So if we look at the five hummingbirds that are um, in the flowers, does that look 100% normal to you all? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> exactly, a big no. And, and, and what's, what's off about it? Well, it's like the flower is sucking the bird in. Instead of the bird, instead of the bird getting the nectar. Exactly. And if you look at the hummingbird that is in flight and the, the hummingbirds that are in the flowers, besides having their head stuck in a flower, how are they different? You know, think about how hummingbirds feed. Yeah. You they know. fly. <laughs> right. Well, I've, never seen, I've never seen that many hummingbirds together at one time. My right. experience with the hummingbirds in my yard is they don't play well together and they certainly <laughs> don't feed in a group. And that is very true. The other thing that they do is when they feed, typically their wings are always in motion. Right. So, so what, you know, what does that kind of make you think about this? What, where does that lead you? They're dead. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and sad but true. And if you look at the title of this work, it is Lime Blossoms. And what that is, is that refers to a process where um, you can chew up wheat and you put it up in the blossoms the hummingbird goes in to feed and gets trapped in the, in the pace that that makes, and they eventually suffocate or get, have a heart attack and die because you know, their little hearts are racing anyway. So this is actually, for all of the, what we think is a pretty picture of hummingbirds, it's actually not. It, they're harvesting these hummingbirds. Mm -hmm. So if we look beyond this picture, and this kind of relates to the uh, those left behind that Sheila um, had us, led us through discussion of. And then the first image, a pool party, and there's a big statement here about man and animal. Um, anybody want to gesture or, or um, talk about what that might be? Look at the smokestacks, too. Exactly. I think the smokestacks represent, and this is my view, so you know, mm -hmm. but to you all, what do smokestacks represent as far as mankind goes? Industrialization. Pollution. Exactly. Pollution, yeah. Right. The modern age, um, um, you know, advancement, you know. But how advanced is it to slaughter hummingbirds for, to harvest them? And I'm assuming just because they were used decoratively. I have no idea why you would harvest a hummingbird. Certainly not for food. They're not big enough. But Does that really happen? Uh, yes, because actually when I did research on this, I looked up liming blossoms. That's where I learned about the wheat and they chew it. And, and it's specifically used to trap hummingbirds in blossoms until they die. What year is this painting? And the, the image is actually 2007. Um, really? Look, look, the factories are probably not that modern. You can't really see it, but down on that 
river in the bottom right, there are some cabins so that you know this is a human endeavor. Mm -hmm. Did they say what the purpose was for harvesting the hummingbirds? I think it was decorative. They were harvested and used as decoration. Yeah. Like um, the feathers, you mean? Right. Well, you know. uh. So, you know, if you think about that, if you look at the factories, the, the, hum, the hummingbirds stuck in the blossoms to die, used for decorative purposes, what kind of message do you think that sends there? Destruction. Although it is true that uh, people in his, historical times have used uh, things to decorate with, you know, uh, ne necklaces or color to put on their face or so it's probably not not something new that humans would destroy something in order to in order to decorate themselves for war or for a party or you know for a, a commemoration of some kind. So maybe it's characteristic of humankind to destroy something to just make their lives more interesting. And I think that's a, a, a good observation in that you know. Um, exactly like we're destroying these beautiful creatures to decorate ourselves with or our houses or whatever. And the fact that we have a factory in the background, um, which shows human advancement, but then that begs the question, how advanced is this if we're, you know, trapping and killing hummingbirds to decorate our houses kind of thing? You know, and then that lone hummingbird, anything, any comments on that? I would like to think that he's being wary. Me too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He looks like he's pausing and he has sort of a, a what, a, um, a look on his face. If I, I, I'm not sure that this is all it's cracked up to be. And I hope he flies away. Right. I hope he doesn't get trapped. Because he is, I kind of agree with you, he is kind of watching the situation and, and very unsure. But he's like a little smarter maybe than the others. And uh, he, he looks like he wants to go in, that he's ready to dive in, but yet he's uh, contemplating what he sees has happened to the other hummingbirds. Well, and if we kind of, um, as I mentioned in the first image, if we take out the animals and put in humans, how many of us either have seen that or watched that where we know it's a dangerous situation, but we're not sure if we should do it or not? Or we learn from the mistakes of others. Exactly, exactly. So let's kind of wrap this one up only because we had such a good discussion on the first two that, that our time is up. So if you and Kelly flip to the next slide, and this is Lime Blossom by Walton Ford, color etching and Aquatent on paper. Um, and it is, it's actually rather small. The plate itself is 12 by 9, and it's on an 18 and a half by 14 sheet. I mean, just a quick blurb on Walton Ford. He was born in 1960, so he's very contemporary in Larchmont, New York. He uh, got his art education in, uh, at the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, and he does a realistic study of flora and fauna, as we can see here, very realistic. You know, and his images tend to be filled with symbols, um, clues, and jokes. Um, and I can we see all that here. And he very much um, does narratives that critique the history of colonialism, industrialism, as we talked about with the factory policies, natural science, and humanity's um, effect on the environment, as we saw there. So with that said, any last questions or comments? So, all right, I want to thank everybody again today for an, another um, very fulfilling Slower Friday. I always enjoy hearing what you all have to say about the works of art. And as I mentioned before, I've seen these before, and every time I do a Slower Friday and bring in an image that I'm familiar with, people see things that I had not noticed before. So again, this exhibit, um, A Telling Instinct, is at the museum. I think it's through November 20th. Is that right, Kelly? Do you know? 
I think it's November 30th. 30th, I believe. Okay. So, if you know, if you get a chance, come in. Uh, because it's a very beautiful exhibit, and as we saw today, very thought-provoking. So with that said, I am done. Thank you all so much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Hank. You. Thank you, Sheila. We appreciate you leading the discussion today. Thanks, everyone, for being here and participating. Thanks. We hope we hope you'll join us again in the future. Uh, next week's topic is before social distancing. And that conversation will be led by master docent Doris Potash and touring docent Barbara Pressman. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Bye-bye.